Nachkun will talk about iron removal in diabetic macular edema. So, after hearing the dangers, let me talk about what I do. So usually what we want in medicine is, is base our practice on uh, evidence, uh, which means basically this. We have a disease which is getting more and more common. And as we know, diabetic macular edema is the number one cause in, of blindness in this disease. So you do as much control over the systemic condition as possible. You do laser. And then as treatment options, we have, of course, injections and implants. This is the theory. In reality, this is what happens. So my question is, what's wrong with this? And I listed only five here because we don't have time for more. The first is the statistics, which, as we know, can be twisted in any way to prove anything you want to be proven. I will give you just two very quick examples how it can mislead you. First, you have a computer and you feed the following information into the computer. I had vodka with water and I got drunk. I had wine with vodka, uh, water and I got drunk and I had whiskey with water and I got drunk. So what will the computer tell you is that vodka is fine, but don't drink water because that was the common thread among all three. The second problem is if you accept the study blindly. In other words, you eliminate your brain from the process. So here's a question. Should you open the parachute if you jump out of an airplane at a thousand meters? Because can we have the sound? Yes. So we know that bad things can happen even if you do open the parachute. Uh, but do we have evidence that it works? And indeed, the British Medical Journal a few years ago published a question whether it makes sense to open the parachute. And the answer was we don't have a study to show that it works. So we should have a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial to see if it's worth opening or not. So the problem with these studies is that you look at the tree, but you don't look at the forest. Because we are not dealing in this case with a sick tissue. It's not even a sick eyeball, it's a person. So what you have to imagine now is you are the patient and you go in and you have an injection and your visual acuity, of course, goes up until a few weeks later, it goes down again. So now we go and get another injection. And here is the next issue then, the cost of it, because somebody has to pay for this. So, and I just want to tell you that a few days ago, I heard about a patient who received 81 injections. So in three years, what you do is you take this Mercedes and place it inside the vitreous cavity. And here is a list of the cost of some of these medications. And I just want to remind you of the CAT study, which a few years ago basically showed that the drug that costs 100 times more than the other one is pretty much has the same efficiency but the cost of the study to prove this is over $50 million. And then the question is, which of the companies rushed to finance that study? And of course, none. So now the question is, which company will sponsor a study to compare medication with surgery? What is surgery? Well, I'll come back to that in a second, and I'm going to skip these slides of the technique because we are a little bit late. But certainly, I agree that if you do ILM peeling on a diabetic patient, your technique has to be different from peeling the ILM in an eye that has an otherwise normal retina. So a couple of things I want to emphasize. The first is you have to be very slow much slower than your normal iron peeling would be. And the angle at which you peel to reduce the, the trauma that you are going to affect on the retina, you have to move your forceps pretty much parallel 
to the retina. So not lift up, but move parallel. And we can talk about, if we have time, uh, about how to grab uh, the tissue, and I fully agree with you that you always have to avoid the macular papillary bundle because you don't want to create more problem than you already have. But I just very recently had a, a fellow of mine to look at some recent results. And you can see that with a single surgery, it's a 91% permanent drying, with 72% of eyes having at least three Snellen lines of improvement. And one of the other beauties of vitrectomy is that this is a process that if it did not work, you can still continue with your injection. So the question then is why this surgery is not done more often? And the answer is here. So I, I spent a lot of time to find out what the studies show. And you can see the numbers here. Uh, this is the actual numbers of studies that really looked at the treatment of diabetic macular edema. And you can see here that surgery was used in 1% of these studies. On the left, and I promise I will not read this to you, these are all the things that have been tried. And everything on the left-hand side has been standardized all the way to the size of the nurse who will bring the injection cannula to you. My vitrectomy is not standardized. In other words, mouse and mouse are the same thing. So, <clears throat> Uh, this is one problem with all the studies. The second one is usually when they say vitrectomy, it is the last resort. Nothing else works, so net, now let's try surgery. And my experience over the many, many years that I have been operating on eyes with this condition is that if you do it early and you do it properly, which means ideally you give an injection preoperatively, so by the time you do your surgery, uh, the macula is dry. Uh, your results are much better. So, uh, again, there are certain things that we all do or should do in, in uh, dealing with these patients, which is uh, systemic control, and we try to do as atraumatic in surgery as possible. But the message is to do this early and not when everything else fails. And we have to pay attention to all the details. And I know that today this is heresy, what I said, because we switched from being surgeons to injectionists. But I think even then we must not give up thinking uh, and have a concept before we act. Honey, <laughs> what are you doing? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ferenc, uh, for a very attractive presentation. Um, I, uh, is there any question from the floor? If not, I would like to ask you one more. Um, actually, I was, I was also doing uh, vitrectomy as a last resort. But after the results of uh, European Vitreoretinal Society macular edema study, which have shown that uh, macular edema is quite very well treated with vitrectomy, then I think we have to change our uh, way towards vitrectomy. So um, do you have any uh, suggestion, any other suggestion in eyes with uh, very sticky ILM? Uh, it's because this is very prevalent in diabetic eyes. Should we insist on doing uh, ILM peeling or we should just remove the uh, posterior hyaloid and leave it alone just not to be too, so traumatic? Uh, it's a very, very, very good question. I, I do not have comparison data. I can tell you what my experience has been over the many, many years that I have been doing this. The ILM is indeed different in these eyes. It's thicker and usually it's more adherent. I remember one case where I counted how many times I had to go back and re-grab it and I stopped counting at 36. So it is not the same, as I said, as an eye with an, a normal retina. But what that tells you uh, is that if this 
is an ILM that is indeed different uh, in, in behavior and anatomy from the ILM that you see in other diseases, maybe it is part of the problem. So I do think that it is important to remove it. I also remove it in a fairly large area. Uh, and again, my numbers so far, uh, I'm, I'm very confident in saying this, uh, prove that for the patient, it should be an option that is offered as opposed to going to, to inject you know, every month or whatever period for the foreseeable future. I do not make the decision for my patients, and I want to emphasize this. I will not tell the patient, okay, I'm gonna do surgery on you. What I will do is I explain the options and give numbers and let the patient decide. Thank you very much. Antonio? Can I? Yes, perfect. Uh, my question is more technical. Um, if it happens that you know you have to do surgery when there is a macular edema because it's refractory to anti-VGF, and there are you know large, there is a large, large foveal cyst. Yes. Do you still peel the ILM or do you do a foveal spearing? No, peeling? I do peel the ILM, and I, I don't know how well it was shown on the video. This. The, the case I selected to show you was one with a huge cyst in the fovea. So over the many, many, many cases I have done, I remember two cases when I did rupture the cyst. And you see it very nicely because when you do that, you have a little of a schlieren, so the, the fluid is very viscous and you will see that uh, intraoperatively. So I think, again, if you are careful with your technique, in the vast majority of the cases, you will be able to avoid rupturing the cyst. Okay, please. Jerry Sabag from Southern California. Nice presentation, and there is ample biochemical evidence to support the fact that both the posterior vitreous cortex and the inner limiting membrane in diabetic patients are affected by advanced glycation end products, and so there is scientific basis to your observation and our observation that this tissue is very different. Having said that, aged individuals also have advanced glycosylation of the proteins at the vitreo retinal interface. And so my question is, have you extrapolated to treating patients with AMD in the same early vitrectomy paradigm as you have in diabetic patients? Well, it's a very good point, and nobody knows more about this than you do. So my only, my only comment is, is that I do have a, a fi a quite a number of patients who have AMD, and I did surgery for various reasons. If they have an epimacular membrane, I will peel the ILM. Uh, if they don't, I usually don't because uh, of the risk of, of uh, thinning the, the retina that is left behind but I cannot give you an answer because I did not look at, at those patients separately. But after this question, I will. <laughs> I can you. answer maybe uh, a part of it. Uh, I have done some uh, vitrectomy for AMD cases, uh, wet AMD cases, when they have some vitromacular adhesion, not traction, but adhesion, uh, maybe almost seven, eight years ago, uh, just if they were unresponsive to anti-VEGF or uh, suboptimal response is get, but I couldn't get any uh, change after vitrectomy, I can say. And we have done another study on AMD cases who has uh, epiretinal membrane associated with uh, choroidal neovascularization. Uh, we have um, compared the results with those who do not have any epiretinal membrane we have seen that those with epiretinal membranes are more resistant. They need more injections, and the injection interval is uh, much less in those cases. That's all I can say. And there are several studies that support exactly what you just described, um, plus the lack of a response that you alluded to earlier may be exactly what he said a few moments ago, is because you're waiting to use it as the last resort as opposed to earlier in the natural history of the disease. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sebag. Thank you.